everyone, and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over the AP Chemistry FRQs from the 2022 AP exam. Specifically, we're going to be going over the first FRQ that was released. Okay, so first things first. A student reacts 0 0.300 grams of methyl silicylate with a stoichiometric amount of a strong base. This product is then acidified to produce salicylic acid crystals. And that's the, like our introduction, right? So we've got some important information. We've got how much we're starting with here. We know that we're mixing with a strong base. And we know that what we're trying to get are these crystals. So letter A, for every one mole of C8H8O3, and notice they give us a molar mass, which is kind of nice, um, and that's reactant used, one mole of silicylic acid crystals, and again, it gives us the molar mass, is produced. Calculate the maximum mass in grams of HC7H5O3 that could be produced in this reaction. Okay, so just reading over this, they give us a lot of information, and most of it is just pointing towards a simple three-step process, right? So remember that we have a mass-to-mass -mass, uh, stoichiometric calculation we can do. So we're going to start with what we were given here, which is our amount of methyl silicylate. And notice they give us the molar mass, which is awfully nice of them. Not really sure why they gave us the molar mass, but now we don't have to calculate it. So we can just divide by the molar mass. Another thing that we would normally need to do in a situation like this is write a balanced equation. Uh, technically, you could write a balanced equation, right, for what we actually start with. A strong base, so that would be your OH minus. And what would you be manufacturing, right? Well, you'd be manufacturing something that looks like this. So we'd be manufacturing a product of silicic acid crystals because um, then we're acidifying it. So if we had to, we could make a balanced equation, but here they're just giving it to us and saying that we have for every one mole of this first stuff, we make one mole of what we want. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So do we need to include it? Probably not, uh, but you could if you want to just make sure that you're following the standard procedure for doing a three-step process like this. And then last but certainly not least, we have the molar mass of what we want, 138.12 grams per mole. So we're going to multiply by that amount. Okay. So as you can see, our grams are going to go away, our moles are going to go away, these moles are going to go away, and we're left with grams of what we want. So when you do that mathematically, what you end up with is a pretty tiny number, 0.272 grams of what we wanted, the silicylic acid crystals. All right, next. As part of an experimental procedure to purify these crystals after the reaction is complete, the crystals are filtered from the reaction mix uh, mixture, rinsed with distilled water, and dried. Some physical properties are given below. So here we have our properties. Uh, now for letter B, the student's experimental result is basically an 87% yield of our dried crystals. The student suggests that some of the crystals might have dissolved in distilled water during the rinsing step. Is the student's claim consistent with the calculated percent yield? Justify your answer. Well, let's start with what we actually are very interested in. We're interested in whether or not this can be explained by dissolving crystals in distilled water during the rinsing step. So if we take a look at the very beginning here, it says that we are filtering it, right? So generally what happens, right? You've probably done an experiment like this before where you had to filter something, and this is just a standard gra gravitational filtration. We're not doing anything crazy here. We don't have a vacuum pump, I guess. Um, is you're pouring your substance through uh, this filter paper and our filtrate is dripping out, which we don't care about, but what we do care about are these crystals here. So generally speaking, what you would do to make sure that you got every single little bit of your solution that you're trying to filter out is you would try to, you know, maybe shoot some distilled water around here, pour it again, and then maybe shoot some distilled water directly onto the filter paper to make sure that like everything is kind of getting nice and cleaned to make sure that we have like a pure product or a relatively pure product. So the question here is an 87% yield, can that be explained using solubility? So we take a look here where it says the solubility is 2.2 grams per liter. So based on that, is the claim consistent? So really what they're interested in here is, can you explain uh, that we had a lower yield by about 13% by these crystals dissolving in distilled water? And based on our solubility here of 2.2 grams per liter, I'm gonna say yes. 
And I'm going to say yes, because if you think about it, if we go back to, you know, part A here, uh, we only made 0.272 grams. That already is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Now, if your substance is moderately soluble, like this substance appears to be, then you might end up losing about 13% of your yield. That is a totally reasonable explanation. All right, next, given the physical properties in the table, so we have some uh, the same properties that were given on the previous slide there, uh, calculate the quantity of heat that must be absorbed to increase the temperature of a 0 0.105 gram sample of our dry crystals, again, giving us the molar mass of the crystals, from 25 degrees Celsius to the melting point of 159 degrees Celsius. And we want to melt the crystals completely. All right, so we've got a lot of information here. The quantity of heat being absorbed, right? So we want to know joules. Um, it's giving us a starting amount and a molar mass. It's telling us the starting temperature and it's telling us the ending temperature. And it's also giving us the information that they need to melt completely. So if I take a look at my chart here, I've got the melting point, which it already told me in the question, so I'm not really going to need to use that. It gives me the specific heat capacity, though. That's super useful and also in joules here at the very top, right? Joules per gram degree Celsius. Um, in addition, it's saying that I'm trying to melt crystals completely, so that means I'm going to have to use the heat of fusion because that's what I use in order to melt a solid. Okay, so first step, what are we going to do? It looks like a Q equals MCAT question, right? So remember, this is our uh, joules, so that's our energy or our heat. Uh, this is going to be M for mass, C is our constant, in this case, our specific heat capacity. And then delta T is going to be the difference between 159 degrees and 25 degrees. So when I'm done setting it up, this is what it's going to end up looking like. It's going to be this times this times this. And notice grams are going to go away, Celsius is going to go away, and you're left with just joules. So when you do that mathematically, you get 16.5 joules. All right, but that would be if we were just getting it to 159 degrees. At 159 degrees, these crystals are going to start to melt. And so we want them to melt completely. So that means we need to use, for step two, the heat of fusion. So the heat of fusion here is equal to uh, N, right? So that's our number of moles times our change in the heat of fusion. And so our heat of fusion here is going to be 27.1 kilojoules per mole. Now notice that this is in kilojoules and this original amount is in joules. So either I'm going to have to convert from kilojoules to joules or joules to kilojoules. I'm sure it probably didn't matter which one you picked, but I'm just going to convert from kilojoules to joules since I know that's a more reasonable uh, number or is going to be a more reasonable number. So I need to convert from grams to moles, so I still use the same amount of grams to start with, and they give us the molar mass, which is awfully nice of them. So by dividing by the molar mass, now I have moles. Notice grams is going to cancel. All right, next, I'm going to multiply by the heat of fusion, 27.1 kilojoules per mole. But I don't want kilojoules, I want joules. So I'm going to multiply by 1,000 joules over kilojoules so the kilojoules go away. And now I'm left with an answer that is just 20.6 joules. Okay, great. Now I can add them together. And when I add them together, I get 37.1 joules, again, being a very reasonable answer. All right, what about letter D? We have these two structures, right? So it says the structures and melting points for methyl salicylic and salicylic acid are shown below. The same three type of intermolecular forces, lemon dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, exist among molecules of each substance. Explain why the melting point is so different. Like if we take a look here, negative 9 degrees Celsius compared to 159 degrees Celsius, there has to be structurally, even though they look very similar, some difference here. And so what I really am interested in is why. Why are these melting points so different? Well, if you know anything about our functional groups, right? Right here we have an ester. Here we have a carboxylic acid. Here we have an alcohol. Here we have an alcohol. So what do I notice? Well, I notice that there's basically going to be a single alcohol group here. And remember, for hydrogen bonding, right, what you really need is some... OH groups. You need some alcohol groups. That would really help. Uh, here I have two. Now, yes, this is part of a carboxylic acid, but the OH is still free, right? It's still an OH group. So because I have two sites for hydrogen bonding on this molecule and only one 
uh, site for hydrogen bonding on this molecule, that's probably going to make a pretty big difference. And you can kind of see here, right? This is just a nonpolar little bit stuck on the end, whereas this is an extremely polar bit stuck on the end. So there are two sites for hydrogen bonding in sal salicylic acid. The more hydrogen bonding there is, the stronger the intermolecular forces. And as a result, you're going to have a higher melting point. All right. A student is doing a titration. So they're titrating 20 mils of a point 0.01 molar HC7H5O3 um, with 0.0200 molar NaOH using a probe to monitor the pH of the solution, and the data is plotted using the titration curve below. So E says, using the information in the graph, estimate the pKa. Um, okay, so you got to know something about pKa, the henderson helsebach equation. So remember that the pKa is equal to the pH at the exact point where these are both the same number, right? So the log of whatever, it could be 1 over 1, 0.5 over 0 0.5, 0 0.25 over 0 0.25. No matter what, the logarithm of, you know, 1 is going to be 0. So the pH is going to be equal to the pKa. And hopefully you know that happens at exactly the halfway point um, before we get to our nice little curve here. So going from the start here to here, we want to find the midpoint, right, the, the middle point between these two. And so if we take a look, right, this is 0, this is 10, so I'm looking at 5 here, right, where I've added 5 milliliters. And so if I move all the way up, it's above the line. It's not exactly on the line. It's kind of hard to see that, but it is above the line a little bit. So to estimate it, I'd say maybe 3.1. Okay, again, you may, there's probably a range of values that are acceptable um, for that particular answer. Now, when the pH of the titration mixture is 4, right, so at the pH of 4, is there a higher concentration of the weak acid, because remember, this is like the buffer region here, or its conjugate base in the flask, justify your answer. Okay, so I want to find where we are when we're at 4. So if I take this line over, it's going to be right here. So it's going to be past 8 on my... Um, it's going to be past 8 on my milliliters here. And not noticing that this is our halfway point, if we want to actually just kind of remember a little fact about titration curves and buffer solutions here, on this side of the line, this is where the acid form predominates because this is going to be the bigger number. On this side, this top part of our fraction, the numerator, is going to be bigger. And so if we're in anywhere in this area here, that means the base form is going to predominate which means that this ion is going to be, since it's our conjugate base, the most prevalent um, species between the weak acid and the conjugate base in the flask. How can you justify that? Well, we're more than halfway to the equivalence point. Okay, remember this is our halfway point. And so again, using the henderson hasselbalch equation, this number has to be bigger and this number has to be smaller. Um, and that makes sense because our pH has to be above um, you know, the pKa, it has to be above three and it is, it's, you know, whatever it's four. So it, it's gotta be, it's gotta be higher on our, on our list here. All right. The student researcher, or sorry, the student research has been zoic acid and finds that it has a similar property, right? Similar property wise to salicylic acid. The P, uh, sorry, the K, <laughs> I can't read the Ka for benzoic acid is 6.3 times 10 to the negative five. Calculate the value of the pKa for benzoic acid. All right, also from our formula sheet here, pKa is equal to the negative log of the Ka. They give us the Ka, take the negative log of it, that's going to give us the pKa. So it's 4.2, okay, and the, that is definitely a higher pKa uh, than the pKa on the previous slide. All right, so now that's kind of important because the last question says that they're performing a second titration using, in this case, 20 mils of a 0 0.01 molar solution of benzoic acid. And they're titrating it with the exact same stuff from before, 0 0.02 molar, or uh, uh, blah. <laughs> they're titrating it with the, in the exact same way. So this is the previous graph for, silos, uh, for salicylic acid. So now it wants us to basically add the points for what the curve would look like for benzoic acid. And it says the initial pH of the benzoic acid solution is 3.11. All right, so that means that I'm going to be somewhere over here to start with. And so I'm going to put that on our graph here. In addition, right, 
our pKa of our salicylic acid was right here, about like 3.1. And so here it's 4.2. So that's definitely higher up. So I'm going to add that point on my graph. In addition, it's going to, you know, it's still the same amount. We were starting with the 20 mils of benzoic acid. We're starting with our, uh, our the same uh, type of concentration here also. Um, so that means that our equivalence point is still going to happen right at 10. And then last but not least, um, what I really like to look at is uh, how do I finish off this graph? And so I'm just going to select a point off the graph so that I can connect my dots and end up with something that looks like the same shape. Uh, keep in mind uh, that is not supposed to be as sharp. It's supposed to actually curve nicely. Uh, but for some reason, it kind of became a very a very sharp curve here. Uh, it is supposed to still look like our familiar S curve, though, that titrations have. Uh, and that's basically it. So no pun intended, because we're talking about NaOH. Um, but yeah, so if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we'll be continuing this process for the next couple of FRQs from 2022.